Climate Summit in Katowice, Poland. This is Democracy Now! Thousands of climate activists march in Poland to call for climate justice as the United States joins Russia, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait in watering down a statement accepting the UN's landmark scientific UN study on the catastrophic threat of climate change. This comes as Poland's right-wing government blocks at least a dozen climate activists from entering Poland. It's absolutely uh, extremely concerning um, that those uh, organizations representing the voices of people are shut out when in the same voice, uh, the, uh, just yesterday an executive at Shell was practically boasting about their influence in the Paris Agreement. But first, federal prosecutors have accused President Trump of committing a federal crime by directing illegal hush money to two women during the presidential election. Could this lead to Trump's impeachment? We'll speak with investigative journalist Marcy Wheeler. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're broadcasting from the UN Climate Summit in Katowice, Poland. Federal prosecutors have accused President Trump of committing a federal crime by directing illegal hush money during the presidential campaign to two women, adult film star Stormy Daniels and former Playboy model Karen McDougal, during the presidential election. The accusation is contained in a sentencing memo for Michael Cohen, Trump's former attorney, who's admitted that Trump directed him to pay the women in order to prevent them from speaking to the media during the campaign about their alleged affairs with Trump. Incoming House Judiciary Chair Jerry Nadler says the payments could be an impeachable offense. He was interviewed on Sunday by CNN's Jack Jake Tapper. If it's proven, is, are those impeachable offenses? Well, they would be impeachable offenses. Uh, whether they are important enough to justify an impeachment is a different question, but certainly they'd be impeachable offenses, because even though they were committed before the president became president, uh, they were committed in, 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 in the service of fraudulently obtaining the office. Uh, that would be the—, the uh, that would be an impeachable offense. Trump's former personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, is being prosecuted for the payments by the U.S. Attorney's Office of the Southern District of New York. On Friday, special counsel Robert Mueller also issued a sentencing memo for Cohen, as well as Trump's former campaign chair, Paul Manafort, as part of the probe into Russia's meddling in the 2016 election. We'll have more on the significance of the filings after headlines. President Trump announced Saturday his chief of staff, John Kelly, would step down at the end of the year. Early reports said Trump wanted Vice President Mike Pence's chief of staff, Nick Ayers, to replace Kelly. But Ayers said Sunday he will not take the job and will soon leave the administration. The New York Times is reporting President Trump's adviser and son-in-law, Jared Kushner, circumvented White House protocol by having private conversations with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia after the murder of the Saudi journalist, Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi, by Saudi hitmen on October 2nd in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, Turkey. Kushner reportedly advised the Crown Prince on how to, quote, weather the storm. President Trump and a number of top White House officials have refused to acknowledge bin Salman's involvement in the murder, despite the CIA concluding with high confidence that he was directly responsible for ordering the killing. CNN is reporting Khashoggi repeatedly said, I can't breathe, during his final moments alive in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul before he was murdered and dismembered. President Trump has nominated William Barr to be the next attorney general. Barr previously served as attorney general under President George H.W. Bush in the early 1990s and is known for his expansive view of executive power. If confirmed, Barr will oversee Mueller's investigation 
As Bush's attorney general, he was involved in the pardon of six Reagan officials for the Iran-Contra scandal. More recently, he's expressed sympathy for President Trump's demand that Hillary Clinton be prosecuted over her use of a private email server. Barr also supports former Attorney General Jeff Sessions' positions on so-called religious freedom and his hardline stance on immigration. In 1995, Barr wrote that the U.S. government should not be secular and should subsidize Catholic religious education and promote laws that, quote, restrain sexual immorality. The European Union's top court ruled today the United Kingdom can unilaterally reverse Brexit any time before March 29th, the deadline for the U.K. to leave the European Union under the current schedule. The ruling comes as British Prime Minister Theresa May moments ago called off a parliamentary vote amidst vocal opposition, including from within her own Conservative Party. If May fails to pass a vote on Brexit, it could undergo a second referendum. Thousands of demonstrators from both the Remain and pro-Brexit camps took to the streets in London over the weekend ahead of the crucial vote. In France, the Yellow Vests uh, protests continue for a fourth consecutive week. An estimated 130,000 people took to the streets across France over the weekend, resulting in over 1,700 arrests. In Paris, major attractions, including the Louvre and Eiffel Tower, were closed in anticipation of the demonstrations. Protesters and police clashed again in the capital and other cities, with police firing rubber bullets, water cannons, and tear gas at crowds, and some protesters smashing windows and setting vehicles on fire. The French government halted plans for the fuel tax hike at the center of the protest, but demonstrators are calling for additional economic reforms and many for the resignation of President Emmanuel Macron. Macron is set to address the nation later today. Meanwhile, a video has gone viral showing French high school students lined up on their knees with their hands behind their heads on their backs as police officers watch over them. Students have been protesting plans to reform the exam system. Some Yellow Vest protesters kneeled before police in Paris Saturday in a gesture of solidarity with the students. Yellow Vest protests have started in other countries, including Belgium, where about 400 people were reportedly arrested over the weekend as protesters clashed with riot squads in the capital, Brussels. Here at the UN climate talks in Katowice, Poland, the U.S., Saudi Arabia, Russia and Kuwait have blocked language welcoming October's landmark U.N. IPCC climate report, which warned of the catastrophic effects of a global temperature increase of 1.5 degrees Celsius or 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit, beyond which global crises could unfold at a rapid pace. The four countries rejected using the word welcome, insisting members instead note the findings of the widely cited U.N. report. The report was blocked hours after thousands of climate protesters marched in Katowice on Saturday to call out Poland's promotion of coal mining and to demand urgent action on climate change. Major climate protests took place in a number of other Polish cities, uh, as well as in Montreal, where protesters spoke out against the Trans Mountain Expansion Pipeline, and in Paris, where an estimated 25,000 people marched at times overlapping with the Yellow Vest demonstrations. Climate nowadays is really fundamental, and in particular in a context of social debate. Both causes converge because decision makers and leaders are elected to take decisions in both areas. And today the context urges us to fight, because there is a climate emergency and also an increasing social emergency. We'll bring you voices from the protests here in Katowice later in the broadcast. In Colombia, an indigenous governor from the southwestern department of Cauca was killed last week. Edwin Dagua Epia had received death threats from paramilitary groups prior to his murder. A local human rights group reported 10 indigenous people have been murdered in Colombia in a span of just eight days. Another indigenous governor in a neighboring area was attacked Saturday but survived. Local leaders are calling out the far-right government of Ivan Duque for the spike in murders and a failure to protect indigenous leaders. 
In Virginia, a jury convicted self-described neo-Nazi James Alex Fields of first-degree murder for killing anti-fascist protester Heather Heyer at the deadly Charlottesville rally last year. Fields plowed his car into a crowd of people protesting the white supremacist Unite the Right rally, killing 32-year-old Heyer and injuring 35 others. A sentencing hearing is set to take place today. Fields is also facing separate federal hate crime charges, which could result in the death penalty. In Canada, prosecutors have confirmed that Meng Wanzhou, chief financial officer of the Chinese tech giant Huawei, was arrested in connection with possible U.S. fraud charges linked to Iran sanctions. Meng was arrested in Vancouver December 1st after a U.S. arrest warrant was issued in August. She now faces extradition to the United States. Meng, who is also the daughter of the founder of Huawei, is accused of using a subsidiary, Skycom, to mislead financial institutions and to try to import U.S.-made technology to Iran in violation of U.S. sanctions. China's called for Meng's release and summoned the U.S. and Canadian ambassadors over the weekend. And this year's Nobel Peace Prize was handed out today to Dr. Dennis Mukwege and Nadia Murad. Dr. Mukwege founded the Panzi Hospital in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which treats women requiring surgery as a result of brutal sexual violence. Nadia Murad is a Yazidi Kurdish human rights activist from Iraq. She was kidnapped by the Islamic State and repeatedly raped. This is Nadia accepting her award. <laughs> Today is a special day for me. It is the day when good has triumphed over evil, the day when humanity defeated terrorism, the day that the children and women who have suffered persecution have triumphed over the perpetrators of these crimes. I hope that today marks the beginning of a new era, when peace is the priority and the world can collectively begin to define a new roadmap to protect women, children and minorities from persecution in particular, victims of sexual violence. From the UN Climate Summit Talks. I'm Nermeen Sheikh. Welcome to our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. Federal prosecutors have accused President Trump of committing a federal crime by directing illegal hush money to two women during the presidential election. The accusation was revealed Friday in filings made public by the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York, including a damning sentencing memo for F President Trump's former attorney, Michael Cohen, who's admitted to paying the women. The memo states, quote, with respect to both payments, Cohen acted with the intent to influence the 2016 presidential election. He acted in coordination with and at the direction of individual one, end quote. Individual one is a reference to President Donald Trump. The payments were made to adult film star Stormy Daniels and former Playboy model Karen McDougal during the campaign in order to prevent them from speaking to the media about their alleged affairs with Trump. The sentencing memo was made public Friday, along with two new sentencing memos from special counsel Robert Mueller, one for Cohen and another for Trump's former campaign chair, Paul Manafort. We go now to Grand Rapids, Michigan, where we're joined by independent journalist Marcy Wheeler. She edits EmptyWheel.net, has been closely following the multiple investigations of President Trump. Marcy, welcome back to Democracy Now! Can you explain what's most significant about these filings? And just for people to understand, we're talking about filings from two different places, from the Mueller inquiry and from the U.S. court in New York, from the prosecutor's office, from the U.S. attorney's office. Right. Um, so there's two sentencing memos, actually, for both for Cohen, one out of Manhattan, as you said, the, the U.S. attorney's office in New York, and one out of Mueller's office. And then the, the uh, Manafort thing is actually not a sentencing memo. It's just a memo laying out the lies he told uh, and the reasons he that, that the government has said that he violated his plea agreement and all of the benefits that he thought he was going to get out of that are now gone. Um, the, the news that is catching attention is what, what you just said, which is that in the New York sentencing memo, uh, it makes it very clear. It doesn't accuse Trump yet, but it makes it very clear that what, what uh, Cohen did in, in setting up these hush payments and, importantly, getting reimbursed by Trump organization for these hush, hush payments, um, he did it with Donald Trump's 
knowledge and on his instructions. And there's been, a, in the right wing, they're sort of saying, well, this is just a minor campaign finance violation. Actually, Trump this morning tweeted out and said that as well. But what they're missing is that uh, the language the U.S. attorney in New York uses is very clearly talking about fraud to carry out that, that campaign finance violation. So for example, they point to all of the efforts Cohen and the Trump Organization used to hide the payments and to hide what they were actually for. Things like the shell company that, uh, that um, Cohen set up to carry out the payments. And so I would expect the next charges, the ones that uh, might name Trump as an unindicted co-conspirator, but, but will almost certainly name Trump organization, because remember, his company can be indicted, and also probably whichever one of his children is named in, in those filings as well, they're going to be charged with, a, with what's called conspiracy to defraud the United States. And the argument is that any time you carry out uh, fraud to hide the fact, to hide stuff that pr pr prevents the government from doing regulatory work, um, when you do that, that's a crime in and of itself, irregardless of how serious the campaign finance violation is. So that seems to be where they're going in New York. Um, there's a bunch of stuff in the other two memos that say Mueller has similar kinds of crimes coming in his investigation, um, as well as the conspiracy with Russia. There's, there's still some hints that that's going to come reasonably soon as well. Well, uh, Marcy, I want to go to Democratic Congress member Jerry Nadler, the incoming chair of the House Judiciary Committee. He was interviewed on Sunday by CNN's Jake Tapper about Michael Cohen's admission that he made illegal hush money payments to two women at the direction of President Trump. If it's proven, is, are those impeachable offenses? Well, they would be impeachable offenses. Uh, whether they are important enough to justify an impeachment is a different question, but certainly they'd be impeachable offenses because even though they were committed before the president became president, uh, they were committed in, 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 in the service of fraudulently obtaining the office. Uh, that would be the, the uh, that would be an impeachable offense. So, Marcy Wheeler, can you comment uh, uh, on what Nadler said, its significance? And these are, in fact, impeachable offenses, he says. Because the idea is that you cheated to win. You cheated to win the office of the presidency, and that goes to the core of whether or not you should be president. Um, it sounds like where Nadler's going is the underlying crime, the hush payment, um, may not be grave enough by itself to sustain an impeachment. But as I mentioned, um, there was stuff in the filings on Friday that suggests Mueller's going to charge very similar crimes. Just as one example, one of the things that Paul Manafort lied about is that he was getting um, payments through a super PAC from Tom Barack, who is one of Trump's biggest donors, who's the guy who hired Paul Manafort in the first place. So he was getting um, uh, payments through a super PAC that themselves are probably not legal. And it raises questions. It, the question we've always asked about Paul Manafort is he was dead broke for the entire time he was working for Trump. So who was paying him? And if he was being paid through this super PAC, for example, then it's another example of, uh, of as I said before, the, the conspiracy to defraud the United States. And what I expect is what we see in New York we're going to see parallel kinds of charges, but tied to hiding the role of the Russians uh, in, in Mueller's investigations. And those, I think, together will add up. Um, and, and then the other thing that I think is really important that, that people have just forgotten through this entire process, we keep talking about whether you can indict a sitting president. You know, there's still a debate about that. But really critically, you can indict a corporation. You can indict Trump organization. And that filing in, in, in New York, and frankly, uh, the Cohen filing from Mueller as well, both make it quite clear that the Trump organization was involved in this fraudulent activity. And so I, I think we should start talking a lot more about how Trump is going to react when his eponymous corporation starts getting charged in criminal in, in crimes as well. Because uh, you know that's where his ego is invested. That's where his uh, alleged Billions are invested, and that too, I think, makes him vulnerable in a way other presidents have not been.
So the issue is, I mean, you've got the hush money payments for alleged affairs that Trump was trying to keep secret. Um, but then on the issue of Russian meddling in the 2016 election, which is supposedly what this inquiry was all about, explain what you think is most significant about what um, both Michael Cohen has said and what Manafort has said. Uh, why, for example, building a Trump Tower in Moscow weighs in here and more. And what were you most surprised by, Marcy? Um, it wasn't surprising. We, we're still getting more details about Cohen's version of the Trump Tower deal. But the language that prosecutors, that the Mueller prosecutors here used in his sentencing memo was really stark because it laid out that um, that Trump Tower deal could have meant hundreds of millions of dollars for Trump. Uh, that Trump Tower deal, they make explicit, probably required the involvement of the Russian government. That Trump Tower deal was being arranged at the same time as the June 9th meeting we've heard about over and over again. So that there's that paragraph in the Cohen memo, which lays out the, the stakes of what it meant for Trump, for Cohen, for Don Jr to be open to a meeting with Vladimir Putin and to be open to a meeting from Russians offering uh, election year assistance on, the, on behalf of the Russian government. So the language that Rob Goldstone, who's the music promoter who set up that June 9th meeting, he talks about a package of assistance from the Russian government. And, and the, the Cohen memo makes it very clear now what that would have meant to Don Jr. To Don Jr., it would have meant hundreds of millions of dollars if Vladimir Putin would buy off on this Trump Tower deal. And so it really changes his willingness. Most of the witnesses in that meeting say that at the end of that meeting, he said, sure, we'll get rid of, we'll, you know, we'll revisit these Magnitsky sanctions when and if my dad wins. Um, changes the entire meeting, meaning of that meeting. And I think it makes it a lot clearer uh, what the quid pro quo there was involved, and, 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 it, and it was about money, and again, money for the Trump organization. So um, it's, it goes to that corporate entity that can also be charged, in addition to Don Jr., who keeps talking about his expectation he'll be indicted. And Marcy Vila, what, what do you expect, what steps do you expect uh, uh, the Trump administration to now take? I mean, the White House has essentially entirely dismissed what happened on Friday, saying that nothing new was revealed and nothing damaging to the president. Well, it's not clear they can do much. Um, Matt Whitaker has not been able to prevent anything from happening. It's not yet clear whether he's cleared his ethics review. So it's not yet clear whether he actually is in direct control of the Mueller investigation yet because he should be recused. He should be ethically uh, not permitted to, to be in charge of this. But the thing is that, I mean, you know, the, the Mueller, the, the Manafort discussion about the lies he told, that's going to go forward regardless of what Whitaker said. Um, Again, Don Jr. sounds like he recognizes more and more that Mueller has the goods, not just that he lied, but that he lied for a reason. He lied to hide this larger deal that was going on. And it sounds like Michael Cohen has provided a great deal of evidence uh, in, in support of that. That's why the, the Mueller prosecutor said that um, he actually should get some consideration in his sentencing. So I'm not sure what Trump can do to to to, to Interrupted. I mean, he wants to uh, bring in uh, William Barr as attorney general, but he, too, is going to have ethical problems because he interviewed to be on Trump's defense team. So it's not even clear if he does get confirmed quickly that he'll be able to help Trump in the way that he helped Poppy Bush years ago in, in killing the Iran-Contra crisis. So um, we'll see, but I'm not, I, I think it may be beyond Trump's ability to really undercut this investigation anymore. Marcy Wheeler, we want to thank you very much for being with us. Independent journalist who covers national security and civil liberties runs the website EmptyWheel.net. We'll link to your latest piece. The quid pro quo was even tighter than I imagined. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, we go to the streets of Katowice, Poland, where thousands marched this weekend. And we go underground in a coal mine here in Poland. Stay with us.
music from today's Nobel Peace Prize ceremony, where Dr. Dennis Mukwege and Nadir Murad, a Yazidi Kurd from Iraq, were both awarded the prize for their fight against sexual violence. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. We're broadcasting from the UN Climate Summit in Katowice, Poland. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermin Sheikh. Thousands of climate activists marched here in Katowice, Poland on Saturday, calling for world leaders to do more to keep rising greenhouse gas emissions in check. It was the only permitted protest during the two-week UN climate talks. Earlier this year, Poland's right-wing government banned all spontaneous protests and gatherings within the city. The police have also been given the authority to carry out widespread surveillance during the summit. In addition, Polish authorities blocked some climate activists from entering the country. The Climate Action Network reports at least 12 members of civil society were denied entry into Poland. Well, on Saturday, Democracy Now! was out in the streets of Katowice. I'm part of the Gastivist Collective. So we're here on the street and we are surrounded by uh, Robocops, um, which is ridiculous. This is a completely peaceful uh, protest, uh, beautiful energy from people all around the world. But it is showing uh, the relationship between state power in protecting uh, the interests of the fossil fuel companies. And Europe is imports about half of the world's gas and produces almost none of it. So Europe has a hugely important role to play here. Uh, and Take, using hundreds of billions of euros of public money to build a new generation of fossil fuel infrastructure, fossil gas infrastructure is the wrong direction uh, when all that money could be spent on renewables. If while we're resisting just coal and oil, they build the next generation of fossil fuel infrastructure, fossil gas infrastructure, we're going to have to fight that one next. So we say, look, if the industry is selling gas as a bridge fuel, let's take out the bridge. Let's stop fossil fuel industry right here and let's go directly to the renewable energy transition we need. We don't have have to lock ourselves into another 30 years of fossil fuel infrastructure. Poland, not Poland. Poland, not Poland. Poland, not Poland. I am Dorothy Nalovega. I'm from Uganda. I am part of the delegation of the Global Greens. The Global Greens is a, a network of all green political parties in the world, and we are here at COP to push for policies, to put for measures of uh, climate mitigation uh, that help all the world together because climate change is a global, is a global uh, issue. Yet we know that being greedy is one of the grave causes of climate change. It is greed that has brought about um, the, the attack on the Hamburg forest in German. It is great that has brought about the sand mining in Uganda, my country. It is greed that has brought about the attack on Mabida forest in Uganda, my country. It is also greed that has brought about fracking in the UK. So we are here today on the streets to join others to fight that, to give a message to our leaders to stop the greed and think about the generation to come. Laurent, and I come from the Philippines. I'm with the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. We're saying feminists demand climate justice. We are here to expose and oppose the rise of macho fascism, uh, not just in the hallways of the negotiations, but all over the world. From where I come from, the Philippines, Duterte is a macho fascist, killing environmental rights defenders, human rights defenders, feminists, everyone who gets in his way. And it's the same thing all over the world. We see the rise of a macho fascism who decide on what the future of our planet will be. We cannot allow that to happen. We need to rise up. Time is up for those leaders. The governments here do not want critical voices, and they want to silence us. The Polish bill has been uh, enacted since last year trying to uh, silence critical voices during the climate 
Climate Talks, it says uh, demonstrations not allowed, protests not allowed, but, uh, but as you can see, even if they don't allow it, we will assert for our right to express ourselves and to protest. I'm Sriram uh, Madhusudhanan uh, from Corporate Accountability uh, based in Boston, um, and we're here in solidarity with people's movements around the world uh, demanding climate justice, uh, the people's demands for climate justice at COP24. It's absolutely uh, extremely concerning um, that those uh, organizations representing the voices of people are shut out when in the same voice, uh, the, uh, just yesterday an executive as Shell was practically boasting about their influence in the Paris Agreement uh, and shaping parts of it like Article 6 on markets. This is unacceptable. We have a corporation that still is not being held accountable for a long track record of human rights and environmental crimes, including in the Niger Delta. Um, and for it to be boasting about how it is shaping uh, the global agreement about how the world responds to climate change, that, that's shameful and that's unacceptable. I'm Jaron Brown. I'm with Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, and I'm here with the It Takes Roots delegation from North America, frontline delegation. We feel like the solution of just transition is critical, and the conversation in Poland and being in here even brings it more home to us because uh, we have folks in our movement from Appalachia who right now are taking over Mitch McConnell's office this week because of the conditions happening with black lung and the, the serious health impacts for co-workers and also for communities whose water and land have been polluted. So it's not a question of, you know, workers versus community, but together we have real solutions and that's what our movements are bringing. We're bringing a real vision of just transition that can transform the whole economy while also dealing with this urgent climate crisis. Jacek Bożek, Klub Gaja. We are in Silesia era. This is the place, one of the uh, places in Europe where is a, a not very nice air quality. Not very nice air quality is not very example, good example. We have some places in this place where air quality, quality is the worst in Europe, like in Pszczyna, for example. And this is the reason that people have to use sometimes the mask. This is the mask, anti-smoke mask. And this is the symbol for the COP24, that if we want to talk about changes. The first we have to think about people. My name is Yuyun Harmono. I'm from Walhi, Friends of the Earth Indonesia. Uh, we are here uh, to protesting our government because our government plan to build more coal power plant. It's not compatible with the scientists' recommendation that we need to uh, leave uh, coal immediately. Uh, in developing countries, especially in the south, people are uh, devastated because of climate change. Uh, there is a typhoon, there is a, uh, people have to leave their places because of, uh, they cannot uh, live there anymore. Uh, the water is coming uh, to their place and it's, not, uh, it's impossible for them to live in that place. That is why we uh, ask uh, for the, the South, the developing countries, they have to act fast, they need to reduce their emission, and they need to do it now. I'm Kalakala, and I'm from South Africa, at Life Africa. I'm here to amplify voices of poor people all over the world who are demanding climate justice. We have no more time. This is time to act. My main mission coming here was also to ensure that uh, there is no nuclear subsidies in finance, in climate finance. Uh, nuclear is not a solution to climate change. It can never be a solution to climate change because of the nuclear fuel chain, which is high carbon intensive. So at this COP, what do we expect is for the negotiation us to listen, to actually listen to what um, the IPCC report says, that nuclear is not a solution to climate change. It can never be a solution to climate change, and it should not even be considered. My name is Vidya Dinka from INSAF, which is Indian Social Action Forum. And I come from South India, a coastal city where there is ever-expanding industry, taking away land and water from people and polluting our lives. Climate change is very real now. We see unprecedented flooding in our uh, part of the world. We also see climate change, uh, things getting hotter all the time. And we see that uh, corporations are completely oblivious to it. And even though our uh, nations come here to COP and talk 
all the great talk. Uh, walking the walk is actually much um, needed and that is not happening in our, our countries. They still support corporations and land grab for corporations. They're seeing that they get their subsidies. Farmers are struggling. We had a big march with farmers down Parliament Street from all over the country, congregating in Delhi, which is the national capital, demanding that there is a special session of Parliament for farmers' issues. Because farmers in India are committing suicide, they're struggling every day. This kind of short-sighted development path that we are treading is something that is going to land us all into a, a hellhole. My name is Patricia Royakulo from the Act Alliance Uganda Forum. We are here today because uh, we have the impact of climate change in our country. We are having long droughts and flooding at the same time. So when we are having so much drought, it means the communities cannot grow crops. So they're having hunger, prolonged hunger. Children and women are affected. Children are not going to school because they don't have food at school. Their parents cannot afford school fees because they don't have crops to sell and raise money to, for the family. So the impact is quite grave. When it floods, the farm fields are flooded. Animals are dying. And we, if we do not see this as something grave, if the world cannot see our suffering and cannot commit to finance to enable us cope up with the change, it's not fair. It's not climate justice. So that's why the Act Alliance is saying we want action now, act now for climate justice. My name is Kuba Gogleski. I'm a finance campaigner with the uh, coalition called Development Yes Open Pit Mines No. We are preventing all new lignite mines in Poland. Um, and the colleagues behind me are trying to prevent what is deemed to be the last coal power plant in Poland, a very controversial project. What we are also doing is we are using Poland to change the insurance industry. In Europe, there was a tremendous shift. In the US, the Insure Our Future campaign just started on, in, on US insurers, which are still insuring the dirty tar sounds, pipelines and coal. There was a tremendous shift of the biggest reinsurers in Europe last year, Swiss Remunishri. Brokers already tell us that project in Asia, we are having problems to insure. So this is working. So what we are saying is we actually can make coal uninsurable. If coal is not insurable, we don't have to, we can't build it in Turkey, we can't build it in Indonesia, we can't build it in, in Poland and other places that really need it. Just some of the voices of thousands of people who marched Saturday for climate here in Katowice, Poland. During the protest, one member of the European Parliament, Thomas Weitz of Austria, confronted undercover Polish officials who were monitoring the protest. Democracy Now!'s Tammy Warrenoff spoke to Weitz shortly after the confrontation. So these people don't want to tell us from which organization they are. I'm a member of the European Parliament, and he's telling me first he's not speaking English. Then he speaks English, and he says, we're a group of friends here. I would ask you a last time, legitimize yourself. From which organization are you? You're all dressed in the same way here. For who are you working? Excuse me, sir. Can you hear me? So this is something we see here, how the Polish government hides their own officials. They are not even ready to say who they are and who they work for. My name is Thomas Waits. I'm a member of the European Parliament. Where do you think they're from? I think they are part of the Polish uh, officials. I think they are part of the Secret Service or they are part of the police force trying to hide their identity. Why do you think they're here? I think they're here to uh, control the protest. I think they're here to intervene from inside the protest if there's any problems. But I don't know what they're actually doing here because there's so many police here. There's thousands of policemen guarding this very few protesters here, which is very ordinary people, normal people, not doing anything wrong. This is a complete ridiculous over security measure here. It's important that police guide the demonstration. But these persons here, they try to hide their identity and they have a secret mission. And they're also trying to hide their faces. They're hiding their faces behind scarves. Can you describe the police presence here a little bit? 
the police presence is scary. Uh, the police is completely equipped with big amounts of tear gas. They're equipped with electric tasers. They are completely armed as they would go to war. And it's a complete overdone security measure. And these people here are, I would say, 98% absolutely peaceful, normal citizens using their right to demonstrate. But this is a very militaristic and very aggressive attitude that we see, especially these guys not even saying who they are working for. Who are you working for? Come on, tell us. He's turning around. The message they send is that uh, the, the official representatives of Polish politics do not see the climate uh, rescue movement as allies, but more as enemies. And uh, I can feel that people feel treated here as enemies and not as a welcomed part of civil society. European parliamentarian Thomas Weitz of Austria here in the streets of Katowice, Poland. When we come back, democracy now goes into a coal mine. Stay with us. Immigrant Polka by the Warsaw Village Band. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, the War and Peace Report. We're broadcasting from the UN Climate Summit in Katowice, Poland. I'm Amy Goodmuth, Nermin Sheikh. Protests have just taken place here inside the UN climate talks over a presentation by the United States pushing for the expansion of coal power plants and other fossil fuels. Poland, which is hosting the climate talks, has also used the summit to promote coal. Several state-owned Polish coal companies have sponsored part of the talks. Well, on Sunday, Democracy Now! visited the Guido coal mine near Katowice, which has been turned into a mining museum. Democracy Now!'s Mike Burke spoke with the Polish environmental lawyer Bartosz Kwiatkowski, director of the Frank Bold Foundation, which is involved in numerous lawsuits challenging the expansion of coal mining in Poland. So my name is Bartosz Kwiatkowski. I'm a lawyer, and at the same time I'm a director of Frank Bold Foundation. It's a branch of international NGO based here in Poland, in Krakow. And uh, mainly we work in the area of environmental law. Uh, right now, obviously, we work also with climate change as such. Uh, so our cases in which we are helping other NGOs, so we are making also our own, own activities and we are helping grassroots and citizens. And they are connected with uh, open pit mines, with where lignite is extracted, they are connected with coal mines, and also they are connected with power plants, uh, using coal and lignite to produce electricity. And mainly, as I said, we use uh, environmental approach uh, to, to fight against those installations, uh, but also we are thinking about social problems connected with, with operation of, of this um, whole, whole entities and, and how it impacts life of, of citizens. And can you give an overview of the significance of coal in this region? Oh, it's, it's, you know, it's a very hard question because it used to be the most important thing in Upper Silesia, but it has changed a lot. Right now, in the place where we are, uh, more than 2.2 2 million of people live. At the same time, only 80,000 of them are miners. It used to be uh, more, more than 300,000. Uh, so, so the situation completely has changed. And uh, people right now, many people here in Upper Silesia are against coal as such, because coal is um, using coal and then extracting of coal is connected with many problems we have. I would say that we can uh, look at coal from three perspectives, uh, um, problems connected with coal, we can look at them from three perspectives. The first one is connected obviously with, with climate changes, yeah? so it's connected with operation of our power plants and emissions of greenhouse gases, and I would say it's uh, the least uh, recognized problem by Polish citizens. They don't feel it uh, right now, so, so it, it started this year, a big discussions around that, because of the conference in Katowice which is taking place, because 
of IPCC report. Uh, so, so it started to be uh, a topic in media and also for, for regular citizens. Uh, the other uh, perspective will be national, so using coal, uh, lignite and, and um, regular coal, hard coal, as a fuel to, to heat your houses. It's a very, very big problem in Poland. Um, many people still use this, uh, this fuel as a main fuel to, to heat houses and because of that we have a huge problems with air quality. And the third thing uh, will, be, will be local, uh, so connected with uh, uh, places where the coal mines or lign open, lignite, uh, open pit mines um, extracting lignite are located. And it's connected with environmental damages, so it's also connected with collapsing buildings and cracks in buildings here in, inside Asia with some shakes of buildings, which happens from time to time. It's connected with lack of water, especially in the areas of open pit mines where farmers are, are uh, have not enough uh, water to, to, to uh, use their fields and so on and so on. So this this free 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 perspectives and I think that most of people right now in Poland uh, see see this uh, the coal and lignite from this perspective. As I recall, 72 percent of Polish people right now think that we should uh, resign from coal as a as a main uh, source of power. See the problem with health um, uh, and uh, impact of, of smoke and air pollution on health is that we cannot really find the direct link between air pollution and, and diseases or deaths. Um, World Health Organization is saying that every year in Poland around 45,000 of people are dying because of, of air pollution. But of course it doesn't work like this that we are going outside our house and just you know falling down and, uh, and, and dying uh, coughing. Uh, it's rather the, the process uh, and for, of course it's a big problem for pregnant women, for elderly people, for, problem, for people who have some heart diseases, lung diseases, some asthma problems and so on. Uh, and so we can see the, some, some regularity right now that every year during winter uh, more such people are dying in hospitals. Can you talk about where we are right now? So we are in the Guido uh, coal mine in Zabrze in Upper Silesia and it's a former coal mine, it's not operating anymore we are um, in the museum and that I think that's the best future for coal mines here in this region uh, to be the museum to show how, how it looked like in uh, many years ago the coal mine uh, was here established in 19th century by, by Donner's Mark family one of the noble uh, Silesian families and it uh, ended their its operations I think in 20 or 25 years ago and right now you can visit and see how the coal mine operated in the 19th century on the first level, but you also can go deeper to 355 meters and see how the miners uh, worked on them there 25 years ago. All right, well, what, let's go in. Okay, okay, let's go. All right, I guess we have to take the lift now. We are going underground. Uh, we are in the lift which uh, miners used to use uh, when going every day down to, to dig uh, coal. And the lift is going quite fast. I don't remember, it's six meters per second, if I remember well. And you can feel it right now. Uh, so yeah, it's dark, cold. We can hear and feel the pressure in our ears uh, because of the, 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 the atmosphere pressure is, is changing. And we are going a few hundred meters beneath the, the, the ground level. All right, here we are. Yeah, thank you. So we are 320 meters on the ground. So so it's it's um, uh, around the, the Eiffel Tower. Yeah, the, the Eiffel Tower is as as high as as the level we are right right now. Yeah. And are there are train tracks down here. Uh, yeah, the, the the train with coal used to travel here. So the coal was transported to the shaft. Uh, with, with carriages you can see here. The same, the same shaft was used for transporting coal and transporting oh, no. miners, uh, miners on the ground. We are walking uh, through the, the quite narrow and not, not uh, very high uh, tunnel uh, on the ground. We can see the train which was used for, for transporting coal on our right and also uh, walking on, on trucks uh, on which this, uh, these carriages were uh, riding. Oh, that's, uh, that's interesting because here you can see the signature of one of the most famous Polish uh, composers, Krzysztof Penderecki. So yeah, he was here on 15, no, five years ago, 22nd of October, 2013, yeah. So he signed on call. Now we come from the United States and President Trump campaigned on a platform of bringing coal back to the U.S. and opening new coal plants. And I'm wondering if you had a chance to give President Trump a tour of, say, this coal mine, what would your message to him be? 
<laughs> uh, yeah, for, for first message will be look what's happening around the world because we, we, we cannot see it here in Poland, for example, yet. But you can see it in the US already. I mean, some storms, some tornadoes and so on. It's all connected with climate change. And the main reason why the climate is changing, why the temperature is, is rising, is using coal, it's using uh, petrol, gas and so on. So we have to stop to do this. Uh, many people who came here to Katowice and are talking about that all every day, that they are losing their land, they are losing their houses, they are losing their lives because of the climate change. Uh, so we, we can switch to something, something different. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't have, I don't know, labor because we, we can work in renewables, for example, and also many people will be employed there. Um, talking from um, Polish perspective, right now the energy from renewables is cheaper than the energy from, from power plants using coals, uh, using coal, so that's, that's the direction we should go. I also have a question about the protests. We arrived in Poland on Saturday and went straight to the, the street, the climate protest that marched out to the, uh, the entrance of the COP conference. And we were shocked by the number of, of police. Uh, you had both riot police and what looked like undercover police trolling the street for a somewhat small protest. Uh, what were your reaction to what, what happened yesterday? Yeah, the, the, the protest, uh, if I heard correctly, uh, the number of protesters was 4,000 people. And the number of uh, police officers around was more than one and a half thousand. Uh, so it's a little bit crazy, to be honest. And that's the first time I see such a situation that's uh, so, let's say, small um, march. At the time, so, so peaceful march, because people marching there were, were really uh, peacefully um, orientated. Uh, um, gather so many police officers. And uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that fits in, in whole policy that the government is doing around COP. Uh, they are saying that there is a high terrorist risk right now in Poland. Uh, they introduced a special law which is banning the spontaneous gathering in Kato gatherings in Katowice. And there are regulations which allow police and other um, uh, services, uh, such authorities, uh, to uh, make some surveillance over the citizens and the, 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 the COP uh, attendees. Um, I don't see the, the real threats here, and that for me that's not proportional at all, and that's breaching our human rights to, to, to protest, to, to say what we think about the climate change, what we say, what we think about the, our government or uh, other governments' uh, policies. And what message do you think this sends, you know, to climate activists that they're being treated almost like enemies of the state? You know, that's the problem that many of eco-activists are sure that their phones, for example, are eavesdropped. Uh, and many activists uh, were arrested in, in, in the past for, for the actions. Uh, in Białowieża forest, for example, people were, uh, when they were fighting against uh, cutting down the oldest uh, forest in Europe, uh, the, the force was used against them, they were hit it, and afterwards they were convicted, uh, that they were accused of committing crimes. Uh, so, so that's the, the, the message we get every day really here in Poland, and not only in Poland. So, so it's nothing, nothing new for us, but when IPCC is saying that we've got only 12 years to act, I think it's time to, 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 to get to the table to talk and not to, not to fight with each other. We should be partners, not enemies. Now, as a lawyer, can you talk about some of the legal struggles that are going on in this country right now uh, around coal projects and around other projects uh, connected to climate change? Oh, we've got we've got a lot of legal actions uh, taken by uh, not only civic society as such, but only uh, also um, uh, also some uh, investors of power plants who are who, who think that some investments are against their interest. Also uh, taken by um, ordinary people who live uh, near the coal mine or a power plant and those actions are connected with stopping construction of new open pit mines with expanding of old ones with expanding of uh, stopping ex expansion of coal mines uh, here in Asia, for example what, what connects with with um, a huge risk to environment also huge risk for for the uh, comfort and security of people living next to the um, to the coal mine. We also monitor uh, the emissions which, which are um, made by, by power plants. Very often, unfortunately, those, those power plants try to hide uh, how much emissions of, of greenhouse gases or mercury uh, 
uh, they um, they do. Uh, so we are we are using almost every possible legal tool to to stop the um, uh, the, the harm those those this whole sector is doing to the environment and also uh, to the citizens because um, functioning of, of coal mines and especially open pit mines is connected with lack of water. Lack of water means the, the discomfort in your everyday life, but also farmers, for example, cannot cannot operate at all without water. So that's that's a big problem for people as well. It's interesting that they turned this coal mine into a museum. And I'm wondering, you know, how much discussion is going on in Poland about, you know, moving away from coal as an energy source and moving towards renewables? Yeah, as, as I mentioned before, the surveys are showing that 72 percent of people right now is supporting the, the idea of, of living coal. Uh, and this discussion started. Unfortunately, the government, and not only the current government, in fact, all our governments after 1989, uh, support coal and support coal miners uh, because of political reasons. Uh, yeah, but for sure, as I said, the coal is ending. So we, even if we don't want to uh, make a transition, we have to. Uh, and the, the, the faster we start to discuss it, the, the faster we start to make decisions, the better for us and the, the better for climate and environment, of course. Now, what about wind power? Uh, that's a big problem right now because our uh, government, or rather the parliament last year, introduced a special regulation which in fact ban the construction of new wind power. Right now you're, 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 they're trying to expand coal mining, but at the same time they're banning uh, wind, wind power? Yeah, unfortunately that's, that's true. All right, well I guess the lift is here to go back up. You know, well, one final question I have for you before we go is, you know, what is your message for delegates inside the, the UN Climate Change Conference this week, which is, you know, taking place in, in your homeland? Yeah, I think that, that everybody here has, has the same message. I mean, the, the representative of, of third sector of NGOs, that, that politicians talk and leaders act. And I think that that's the, the main message. You have to start acting, not only talking about that. And you have to um, agree with experts. You're not experts in climate issues, and you have to trust uh, scientists who are really experts in the area. And when they are talking, that, that's the last ring for us. And, uh, we've got two minutes before midnight, and we are going to uh, die in some time. We have to act today. Yeah? That's, that's important for us, for our kids, for, for the future of the planet. Polish environmental lawyer Bartosz Kwiatkowski. Just minutes before we began our broadcast today, protesters here at the UN Climate Summit interrupted a Trump administration event promoting coal and other fossil fuels. Shame on you! Shame on you! My name is Leona Morgan. I'm from the Navajo Nation, and we just disrupted the U.S. side event at the COP24 in Poland. And they did the same thing last year. They spoke about fossil fuels. They spoke about nuclear energy as being a solution to climate change. And this is absolutely Shame not true. On you. Shame on you! Shame on you! And that does it for today's show from Katowice, Poland. We'll be broadcasting from the UN Climate Summit throughout the week. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermin Sheikh.